All right, let's get going. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's science seminar. Um, I am Jess Delfiaco. I'm the communications manager with the Midwest CASC or the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, you're going to hear that abbreviation throughout the throughout the event today. Um, thanks so much for spending your Monday lunch hour with us. We've got a great panel discussion lined up for you today. Um, uh, we're going to have several USGS fish researchers talk about their work in researching inland fisheries and climate adaptation. Um, just before we get started, I've got a few housekeeping notes. Uh, one is that you'll notice that we are recording this seminar. Um, please mute yourselves and keep yourselves off video unless you're a presenter until the Q&A portion of this event. This recording will be shared with all of you, all registrants, via email, and it's also going to be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, we will have a Q&A at the very end of this seminar, so please uh, save your questions until then. You're welcome to pop them into the chat throughout, um, but you will also have the chance to um, ask your questions directly during that time. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of our work to the folks who might be new to these seminars. We do them every month. Um, and the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center um, is um, a partnership between the USGS and a consortium of nine institutions throughout our region. Um, and we produce uh, science to help fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate. We are part of a national network of these CASCs. Um, all of which pursue the same mission. Um, and we accomplish that mission in several different ways. We conduct synthesis research that is relevant to kind of priorities that cut across our region. Um, we support a network of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, as well as work with the College of Menominee Nation to run a undergraduate um, research experience. Um, we host capacity building workshops, seminars such as this one, as well as our annual gathering, which is coming up in Indianapolis in August. Um, and of course, we work with the USGS to fund climate adaptation research. I've got just a couple of announcements this time around. I wanna welcome uh, two new members of the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center team. Isa and Ali are both working as summer research assistants with the LA Lobo on our synthesis research project. Um, I think that Isa is online. Isa, if you'd like to just pop on video briefly and say hi, um, you're welcome to do that. Hey, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here this summer and excited to be here for like the first seminar to, to listen in, but nice to meet everyone. Yeah, welcome. Um, and Ali is not with us today, but you will um, see her around, I'm sure soon. Um, and one quick reminder, we do have the annual gathering coming up in just a few short weeks. So if you have not registered yet, you should do that um, to join us and the entire Midwest CAS community um, in Indianapolis on August 14th through the 16th. Um, I think Alyssa is gonna pop that link in the chat or maybe she already did. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and that is it for me. I am gonna hand things over to Holly MP, who is a researcher on the Midwest CAS team to introduce our panelists uh, and get us started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, and thank you all for joining today. Uh, I'm excited today to introduce the Midwest CASC community to some folks on the USGS side of the CASCs. So as many of you are aware, uh, the CASC model brings together USGS federal staff um, with host consortium folks um, at a variety of different levels. Um, and this model can be a bit opaque at times, but there's a lot of great work done on the USGS side of things that directly or indirectly links into the CASCs. Um, and there are a bunch of different CASCs, so the Midwest is just one of the regions. Um, and so I thought um, as the Midwest CAS community grows, there are a lot of opportunities to leverage the USGS community um, that exists. So I wanted to make some introductions and highlight some of the work um, that is ongoing. Um, today, specifically, we're going to focus on USGS researchers who focus on fish and have worked with the Midwest CASC, as well as other CASCs, um, to chat about what collaboration opportunities may look like, fish and climate change, and future research avenues. Um, so we'll do some short introductory presentations from all of our panelists, um, have a panel discussion, and then open it up for questions from the audience. Um, but if at any point during this um, questions come up for you um, as we're talking, um, please feel free to throw those in the chat and, and we'll 
um, be eager to respond. Um, so my name is Holly Emke. I'll be the moderator today. Um, and I'm a research fish biologist with the Midwest CASC. And I um, do research focusing on inland fisheries um, in a changing climate. So I think first up will be Abby Lynch, um, if Abby is available for her slides. Abby, you are on mute, <laughs> just as a heads up. OK, am I sharing the correct slide just yes, to start you things are. off? Thank OK, you so great. Yep. Um, thanks for the, the quick introduction, Holly. And um, the, this is going to be a, a really quick set of slides just to give a, a bit of a flavor um, and introduction of myself and hopefully um, lead into both Lindsay and Bo's uh, short introductions and the discussion we'll have afterwards. Um, so I'm, I'm with the National CASC, and I'm based and calling in today from, from Virginia. Um, just a, a little bit of background on myself. Um, this is just a photo of me with my two sons, Miles and Graham. Um, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Virginia. That's when I first started uh, my foray into to fish and fisheries. Um, I did a, a small project on uh, dusky damselfish in Bahamas and then a, another small project looking at margin mad toms in Virginia. Um, from there, I did my master's at the, the um, Virginia Institute for Marine Science, which is affiliated with the College of William and Mary. Um, and this was looking at Atlantic Menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay and, and looking at population um, genetics for that species. Um, from there, I did a Sea Grant Fellowship um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Fish and Wildlife Services Fisheries Program. And, and through um, that experience, I uh, decided that I, I needed to go back to grad school to do the types of things that I was most interested in and what I was most passionate about. Um, and then I went to Michigan State. Um, Bill Taylor was my advisor there, and my, my dissertation work was looking at lake whitefish and climate change, uh, potential climate change impacts on recruitment for lake whitefish. And since then, um, as Holly mentioned, I've been affiliated with USGS and specifically with the National CASC. Um, so, uh, and another way I think that's kind of fun to plot my uh, professional trajectory might be uh, in terms of uh, how my, my research uh, position has maybe changed over time in that now um, I do quite, quite a bit less in terms of actually um, doing field work and collecting new data, but, but I'm still involved in a number of projects that do that. And I, I want to highlight a few of those that are related to um, interactions with the Midwest cast specifically. So um, just in general, for, for those that, that don't know me, um, I guess I would bin my research interests into these four kind of large uh, bins with, you know, climate impacts to inland fish and freshwater ecosystems being quite central to the type of work I do. Um, looking at inland fisheries um, assessment is, is, is a component of that and how um, inland fisheries specifically contribute to food is another component. And then um, lastly, and this is a, maybe a, a newer element within my research portfolio, and, and the reason that my sons and I are all wearing these rad shirts is, is looking at um, ecosystem transformation. And so I've been involved in some of the resist except direct um, conversations for, for using that as, a, as a, a tool for assisting with climate adaptation and different um, natural resource management scenarios. So very quickly, um, in terms of kind of projects, and I'm going to go through these very fast to, to keep to time for uh, the discussion and for Bo and Lindsay's intros. Um, I'll just highlight a few different projects that I'm working on related to, to bins that are um, linked with with the Midwest cask. So in this rad discussion, um, there's been a number of projects uh, that, that I've been working on. One in particular is a really nice example of RAD in terms of development of a decision support tool related to walleye management in Wisconsin. I'll just leave it as that for now. Um, there's a, another kind of large scale collaboration that we're working on. Um, oh, and I should mention that, that Colin Dasso at uh, Wisconsin DNR it was the lead on, on that um, walleye management tool. Um, another very large collaboration of folks looking at 
how to think about RAD in terms of large river management. Um, and Nicole Ward from Minnesota DNR is kind of the one that's spearheading that group or, or hurting the cats in, involved in that group. Um, another large scale project that we're working on is um, the, the Creel Cat um, database or um, the US Creel and English Survey catalog. Um, I'll, I'll let Lindsay describe a specific project related to that, but um, we, we have um, a couple ongoing projects, one looking at kind of estimating uh, recreational fisheries catch an effort on a very large scale. A lot of the data for, for that um, project does have a Midwest focus, so that, that's a, a feature that's um, something that might be of interest to those in the, the Midwest cast community. Um, and then uh, the second project I'm going to let Lindsay describe because she's the one leading that. And I should mention the the, the first project, um, the lead researcher on that is Matt Robinson, or Robertson, and he's from um, Memorial University of Newfoundland. And then um, another kind of fun aspect that this is, I, I don't get to do a lot of work on um, Corrigonids and Corrigonines, but um, this is a, kind of a fun side aspect of some work that, that I've been able to be involved with. Um, this is because it as a near and dear element to me and just that um, I did my my PhD work on Lake Whitefish. So um, right now I'm helping mentor a Science to Action Fellow um, at Michigan State University. This is Sean Lewandowski and he's looking at um, designing a, a, a decision support web-based tool to kind of look at spatially explicit population models for whitefish under um, different climate scenarios, which is a really nice um, advancement of, of my own PhD work. And then I'll let Bo uh, mention a little bit more on, on the second project that we're both involved with. Um, and this is a, a project that is um, Nikki Berry's dissertation work at University or Miami University um, in Ohio. And, and she's looking at um, impacts of UVA, UV radiation on eggs and larval fish. And so with that, I'll just transition over. I know I went way over time, so I'm sorry about that, Holly, um, to, to I think Lindsay is going next, so I'll stop sharing. No problem. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, and yeah, we'll hand it over to Lindsay whenever you're ready, Lindsay. Oh, of course it comes up in presenter view. Hi all, sorry about that. So hi, I'm Lindsay, I'm a postdoc at University of Missouri, and I work on a few different uh, CASC affiliated projects. So today I'm gonna follow up a bit on what Abby was talking about and kind of drill down into some of the science that we're developing to help inform broad decision-making processes. So um, to give you a bit of a overview of my background, uh, like a lot of folks, I got into this field because I love hunting and fishing and being outdoors. And I've kind of followed that through line through my undergrad work at uh, Penn State and my master's and PhD at University of Nebraska, and now my postdoc at Mizzou. And I've worked on a number of different taxa. So I've mostly bounced back and forth between working on fish and birds with sojourns into large mammals, amphibians, and human dimensions. But the all of my work has sort of pursued two big questions, which are how do humans and animals adapt to climate change? And how do we make conservation decisions in an uncertain climate? So all of my postdoc work is built um, on a foundation of this really amazing water temperature model developed by Jordan Reed, Lindsay Platt, and others uh, at USGS. And what this model does is it links climate and hydrology models to predict daily water temperatures down the water column for uh, several thousand lakes in the Midwest region. And it predicts both back from 1980 to 2020 and forward from mid-century 2040 to 2060 and end of century 2080 to 2100. 
And this is really spectacular because everything that happens in an aquatic system is temperature dependent. So this model really lets us work with Creelcat and work with other big public fish databases to try and get a handle on some applied conservation problems. So as Abby alluded to, my main Creelcat project is using that water temperature model in conjunction with the Creelcat database to model how recreational angler CPUE varies as a function of temperature across the Midwest. And I'm gonna focus on three states here, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, because they've got pretty uh, really high quality creel data and really high quality lake temperature data. And we focused on eight taxa here, um, a mix of pool and warm water fish. So walleye, yellow perch, pikes, smallmouth bass, and rock basses are all pool water fish. And largemouth bass, lapromas, sunfishes, and crappies are all warm water fish. And when we model recreational angler CPUE as a function of temperature and lake size, what we see is that we catch more cool water fish where the water is cooler and more warm water fish while the water is where the water is warmer. And while that seems really obvious, it's really, really cool that we can pull it out of recreational fisheries data that was not collected for this purpose at all. And what this lets us do is understand how fish and people together are responding to climate and model forward how uh, how anglers and fish are likely to be expected are likely to be affected by a warming climate. And when we map uh, that same model prediction uh, framework over warming conditions, what we see is that uh, we expect to see a big drop in CPUE for our cool water species and a big increase in CPUE for our warm water species. And that lines up pretty well to what we'd expect biologically. Um, we know from the ecology side of things that warm water species are displacing cool water species in an, especially a lot of smaller uh, northern lakes because warmer conditions allow them to outcompete the cool water species. But that change isn't the same everywhere. So we have some places where we you know, expect to lose about 30% of our walleye CPUE, but there's a lot of places where that change is really minimal. And this is something I wanna highlight. So even though we're seeing really big regional scale warming patterns, when we start to dig into the variation in those patterns um, at the lake scale, we see a ton of variation. And that's because the underlying hydrology of these lakes means that they have really different responses to climate change. So I'm gonna focus real quick on two lakes here, Lake Rathbun in Southern Iowa and Bull Shoals in, on the border between Missouri and Arkansas, because they kind of highlight what I'm talking about. So Rathbun is sort of your typical uh, big Midwest reservoir, it takes in a lot of surface water. It's relatively shallow at 13 meters. Uh, Bull Shoals, even though it's way farther south, um, it is, very, very deep. It's about 200 feet deep and it takes in a lot of spring water and a lot of bottom water from an upwater reservoir. And what that means is that even though both of these lakes look like quote unquote warm lakes on an average scale, they have really different yearly temperature regimes where Bolshols is sort of insulated in the summer from that big peak that we see at Rathbun. And um, even though it's going to warm by the end of the century, the warming in the shorter term is a lot more modest than we see in, in our uh, Iowa Lake, even though it's much farther north. And the reason that I wanted to highlight this is because when we think about lake warming, it can be really overwhelming to just look at big warming patterns and say, okay, on average, you know, we're going to have one to two degrees warming, warming that's going to be catastrophic. But when we look at things at a finer scale, what we see is that there's a lot of bright spots where if we put a, put effort into resisting in other ways, into making sure that our food web is strong, into making sure that we're engaging anglers and managing water levels and controlling invasive species, we've actually got a lot of adaptive capacity to respond to climate change. So thank you all for listening and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Lindsay. Always amazing to end on a baby photo. <laughs> yeah, it was her first ice fishing trip at 11 months old. Wow, that's amazing. All right, Bo, whenever you're ready, we'll hand it over to you. All right. Let's see here. Better. 
Okay. All right. So um, I'll kind of follow. Abby gave us a good model on how to set this up. So uh, my background started in Kentucky, actually. I was a biology major and was going to be a high school teacher. And then I sort of moved into, a, sort of got more exposed to aquatics there. Uh, went to Clemson and um, dabbled in fisheries, working in rivers, and then decided that I wasn't going to teach high school, but I thought I'd teach college. So I went to Ohio State and um, did more sort of ecological work, but now in reservoirs. And then, I don't know, for you grad students out there, I, I realized I had to do these things called postdocs. I really wasn't expecting that I would have to like go to get postdocs before I got like a real job when I was like in my 30s. But um, I did two postdocs, one um, with Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, which brought me to the Great Lakes, but it was mostly modeling on some uh, round gobies. And then um, I got, I guess, my first real job that was sort of left Ohio and went to Chesapeake Bay, kind of like uh, where Abby did some of her work, but in a sort of a sister school at the University of Maryland. Um, also with some modeling. And then finally landed uh, a job with USGS you know, back in 2004 now. Um, and so for the first 16 or 17 years, I was what's called a deep water scientist in USGS. So we have basically three scientists on each of the Great Lakes. Uh, we go out and we do large surveys. We um, try to assess how many prey fish there are to support the salmon and the trout uh, among all the myriad of stressors in the Great Lakes. And one of my cask projects that I'll briefly touch on is sort of uh, uh, a vestige from this sort of uh, part of my research research portfolio. And then I transitioned during COVID actually to a new more programmatic job, which is uh, sort of look, poking on, focusing on corgonines that word that Abby also used. So this is essentially a subfamily of fishes, um, the subfamily under the salmon, salmon family, that's the white fishes and the ciscos. And we used to have a ton of diversity of these animals in the Great Lakes, and we've lost a lot of it. And so uh, for various regions, reasons that fishery managers are excited about uh, restoring some of that diversity, and we're trying to provide science support to do that. And then lastly, I'll notice, just circling back to the high school teaching, luckily I do get a chance to do some teaching, um, At uh, even though I'm in a USGS position, it's not a co-op position, so if any of you are looking at science center jobs, uh, there are, you are able to sort of outside of your uh, sort of duties, you know, to teach classes, I do it in the evening. So that's just another sort of uh, potential sort of thing to be aware of. Um, so just to quickly highlight two projects. The first, uh, as I said, focuses on sort of the, the prey fish component um, that we focus on here at USGS across the Great Lakes. This is one in Lake Michigan, working with Thomas Hook, and others uh, at Purdue, Michigan Tech, and NOAA. And essentially, kind of like what Lindsay was describing, we're interested in um, using a, a really impressive climate data set about Great Lakes water temperatures um, and trying to figure out what climate variables are associated with good recruitment and we, can we model that. And then trying to flip that and say, what does the future climate look like for these two key uh, species in Lake Michigan? And the thing I really want to emphasize uh, for part of my take homes is that I think this has made the work more, I, I've done a, some climate change work before and it tends to be, you know, I would say good science, it tends, you know, we publish it, but the sort of the connection to the managers maybe falls a little short. So one thing we tried to do in this project was to bring managers in from the beginning, we created this management advisory committee um, you can see the participation we got there uh, just by their logos. And, and we, I think, really benefited from getting them in from the ground up. We meet with them twice a year or so, get a sense of what they think about our results, what scenarios are best for them to model. Like initially, we were thinking, well, let's go out to 2100. And they were like, nope, not that relevant. But <laughs> bring it back to like 2040, 2050. That's really what's going to, again, resonate more with our stakeholders. The second one is the one Abby mentioned, um, how does changing climate and water clarity affect native corgonians? So she mentioned Nikki Berry's work at Miami. Um, Gretchen Hansen's been really helpful at University of Minnesota. Um, 
many colleagues uh, also helpful on the ground sampling some of the inland lakes in, in Minnesota, like Minnesota DNR. We also have Marty Simonson doing a lot of the work uh, here at USGS. And it's really two sort of sub projects. The first is, are there different, now that we're seeing improvements in water quality, perhaps related to changes in uh, watershed management, <laughs> we're seeing clear lakes. That clear lakes means UV radiation can penetrate deeper. So are there differences in UV tolerance across stocks of Cisco from the Great Lakes to Inland Lakes? And then secondly, thinking about the climate part, is there a latitudinal gradient in metabolism or thermal tolerance among Cisco stocks? And this is sort of looking at, uh, forward to a potential reintroduction into Lake Erie, where there's concerns that Cisco may not Habitat may not be there for Cisco. Um, and, and what, if we're going to bring back Cisco, what stock would be best if one is more tolerant? Uh, so, here again, management agencies are co investigators, um, which is, I think, a, a key part to making this uh, more relevant. Um, I need to see that. Sorry. Teams. Go away. All right. Uh, so, the last thing. Sorry, is there a way to hide this? It's been on there the whole time, hasn't it? We're just seeing the slides. Okay, you're not seeing the little thing I see. All right, so, uh, and I think this has been referred to, climate change are really, there's all kinds of stressors to inland fishers, fish and fisheries, and climate change is one of them, and fishery managers often have to focus on urgent and pressing issues, and sometimes that's not climate change. Sometimes it is, but I, I think this especially... <laughs> Sorry, announcement here at the Science Center. Especially in larger, deeper lakes, um, where fish may not be, uh, may have more opportunities to sort of navigate thermal temperatures and not sort of the, uh, hypoxic issues. Um, sometimes they're not thinking about climate as much. So I think that's why it's most relevant when we can bring them in and sort of understand their concerns, their desires, and help them along and sort of co-implement that with them. And my final slide is just a sort of a plug of a good example of that, I think. Uh, so there are 13 management jurisdictions across the Great Lakes. Um, different lakes have different degrees of concern about declining prey fish diversity that are reducing the, um, are potentially threatening the sustainability of the salmon and the trout fisheries. And so all of the management jurisdictions agreed in 2018 to implement an adaptive management framework to try to bring back these Corgonians in the Great Lakes. And so there are, um, um, you know, planning science a part of this. There's that, the, that informs a restoration plan. We put the implementation uh, restoration plan into practice, and then we evaluate it. And then they can, of course, adjust um, <clears throat> their priorities or our implementation. And so, you know, so you don't actually see the word climate change here, but you do see things like threats assessment. Like what are the biggest impediments? Why did why do we lose that diversity? And do those uh, <laughs> threats that occurred once still exist today as impediments? So this is the way I really think about climate changes within sort of a broader framework of all the different things that uh, could be uh, potentially uh, uh, in, inhibiting restoration or conservation of native fishes. So uh, with that, I probably went over long too. I will stop sharing. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, I think that all those presentations were wonderful and I think that leads really well into um, our uh, discussion here. So we have some questions that folks have sent in previously uh, prior to uh, today and then we'll hopefully have additional ones as folks um, hear our discussion. So I think um, based off of the uh, um, panelists' uh, presentations. I think we'll kind of start off with talking about something that Bo kind of at, alluded to at the end there and thinking about, especially for folks here who may not be familiar with 
climate change and fish and kind of those issues and how climate change uh, may not be the only stressor that inland fish communities are facing. So I guess, um, does anyone here have any thoughts um, or the ability to describe how climate change interacts with other stressors um, in the landscape for to affect inland fisheries? Anyone feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think in the Great Lakes, invasive species are one of our big drivers. Uh, changing nutrients, uh, I think, is another really nice sort of synergy or antagonism where, especially if like eutrophication. And so thinking about sort of Lindsay's plots where she was sort of showing epilimnetic temperatures. Um, if you have like, um, not a eutrophication going on. If we don't have a lot of nutrient inputs into lakes, then the hypolimnion potentially could be a sort of a place where there's plenty of good habitat also for fish to sort of find their thermal, optimal thermal habitat. Um, but it, but if there is nutrient enrichment going on, low oxygen concentrations, they're squeezed up into the place where they may not really be able to excel or even survive from a thermal point of view. So um that those are the two two biggest ones i think invasive species and sort of nutrient enrichment uh and then we're sort of flipping the other side sort of talking about nikki's work where in many cases in north america we've made advances since the 70s with the clean water act um in improving so now we're thinking about oligotrophication and sadly invaders like quagga mussels and zebra mussels have accelerated that I shouldn't say sadly, but because <laughs> in some ways, I mean, they're sequestering nutrients in a way that is beneficial to our sort of water quality standards. But at the same time, um, from a fisheries perspective, getting to the point where maybe we don't have as many resources to support fish as maybe a fishery manager might like. Um, and so thinking about new challenges that that brings on, that's sort of thinking about the water clarity and the, the potential stressors that we be. Um, so not directly related to climate, but just, again, one of the many stressors that are sort of both on the menu to be considered. Mm -hmm. Lindsay or Abby, anything to add? Yeah. So the summer squeeze thing is definitely huge. Um, that Bo was talking about. Um, so one of the things that we've been working on is modeling um, sort of safe operating space for fish from a metabolic perspective. And there's a lot of places where the hydrology of the lakes means that the hypolimnion is going to be thermally okay for cool water species for a long time to come. Um, but that oxygen piece is going to be critical. The other thing in artificial systems, especially, is that water uh, levels can change a lot. So I was talking about Bull Shoals Reservoir, which sort of is currently functioning as a kind of climate refugium just because of how it was built. But Bull Shoals is also was actually built for climate for um, flood control and irrigation. So when we have accelerating droughts in addition to warming, especially sort of here in the western part of the Midwest, we might get into situations where the problems of warming are exacerbated by drops in water level in artificial systems, and that might reduce their ability to serve as, as refugia. That's an interesting combination of, of things going on there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add um, very, very briefly in terms of kind of thinking about um, climate with regards to other stressors or threats to, to inland fish and fisheries. I think the, um, for me, you know, because these are such complex systems, um, in many cases, the, such as the examples that Bo and, and Lindsay have both mentioned, um, thinking about what may be the most immediate threat may not necessarily be maybe what you would traditionally think as, as a climate driver. Um, but, you know, when you think about these as a complex system and and recognizing that, that all of these stressors and threats are, are often additive and often have feedbacks and, um, you know, kind of non 
uh, linear responses, uh, recognizing that like the, the importance of, of understanding these interactions is, is really critical in terms of trying to manage sustainably and kind of managing with a, a view to changing system. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see a question in the chat there from Craig, um, and it touches on any um, the concept of uncertainty, which I think is, is something that everyone here highlighted a lot in a note I made, that everyone has highlighted a lot of vari uh, variability, uncertainty in their work, um, and trying to understand how we begin to incorporate and understand that uncertainty, um, both in climate models and results of climate models, effects on fish and outcomes. Um, so any thoughts from folks here on, on incorporating and understanding uncertainty and leading to actionable outcomes? I think that in a lot of cases, the communication strategy we can use for climate adaptation work doesn't have to be future centric as much as we'd think. So I think it's very valid from a scientific perspective to say that we have places that are currently excellent cool water habitat, and it's important to protect what we already have. And that message is true regardless of how much an individual place is going to warm. So that's kind of what I would do is sort of go back to conservation basics and focus on shared value and emphasizing the value of what's already there. And just saying, okay, well, if we have a place that's naturally going to be more climate resilient, then it's important to, it's important to keep an eye on the food web and it's important to manage um, invasive species and to manage eutrophication. So those things, aren't wrong and aren't a waste of energy, regardless of how much exactly it's going to warm. Yeah, that's a good perspective. Um, I think, Craig, it's a good question. Um, and I don't know if you're allowed to share to your perspectives too, or if this is just supposed to be us talking, but um, I, I think when we, um, especially for that Lake Michigan project, we, um, we brought it to that advisory committee. We asked them, because there are so many, especially when you're doing a modeling project, right? There are so many things you can model and we can get um, so caught up in trying to get the model perfect or to simulate sort of observed data and um, having their perspective and sort of you know, help us see, this is what's most important to us helps us at least narrow down what scenarios to, to model. Now, that doesn't address exactly your question about the variability and how to you know uh, communicate the variability we might see in our model simulations and where we might get really tied up the scientists on that. And it is really important if there is a lot of uncertainty around our predictions to communicate that. Um, and, and I think that is the biggest challenge when we have sort of results or outcomes that um, have big error bars around that. I would just say, be honest about that and sort of communicate that as best you can. And, and um, but again, involvement from the beginning to at least, well, with the managers, I would say, to help uh, us understand which variables they at least want to focus on, sort of coupled with our own scientific expertise about what we think might are the drivers of the system right so yeah and I'll, and I'll just add and i see that, that russ has a kind of follow-up question that's just a, a tag on so i'll try to comment uh, uh, to that as well I, I think um emphasizing that you know whatever the state of the science is is the as the best available science and um focusing on using maybe more um, kind of like portfolio strategies in terms of like decisions for how to, how to manage systems or trying to employ bet hedging when possible. I think all of those help um, maybe address uh, outcomes that aren't necessarily anticipated in some way. Um, and that, you know, acknowledging uncertainty can be a difficult 
um, process and communicating with the public. But if you if we're able to um, emphasize that, you know, this is this, this process is as robust as we can possibly make it and recognizing that the outcome may not necessarily be the um, one that was anticipated, I think laying expectations or like managing expectations in that way um, probably helps manage some of the, um, uh, I guess, effects of, of uncertainty in that system. So I'll just leave it at that. But that is a very difficult process and it's something that I think we grapple with quite a lot and especially thinking towards that RAD or resist accept direct framework. That's something that that we struggle with in, in, in that um, community as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a complex, <laughs> challenging issue. Um, I'm going to pivot right to, it sounds like we have, um, or it looks like we have a few questions in the chat, so I want to make sure we get to those before we, um, trans and if we have extra time, I've got lots of extra questions, so I want to um, pivot a little bit to Nikki's question um, that is focused on kind of grad student stuff. So the question is, as a current graduate student, what skill um, um, do you have, wish you had, or would recommend current students learn to help with their work? So um, yeah, I guess kind of a thinking back a little bit, um, what, what would you recommend for current graduate students um, interested in a career in fisheries, I'm guessing is the question. I would, I mean, my recommendation is to ha have as broad of a background as you can. Um, and I like one of the things I feel like I missed out on was not having a, a strong background in sort of conservation and restoration. I mean, even though I did sort of aquatic ecology, I feel like I didn't, and I had a class or two, I didn't really have that per se in sort of my wheelhouse. Um, and I think over the next decades, that's going to continue to be really, really important. Also, from a climate change perspective, um, RAD is a really good example that Abby was mentioning. Um, and then I think quantitative skills are always going to be really important. So just developing a strong skill set quantitatively and with as broad background as you can in terms of inclusive of, of sort of a restoration or conservation standpoint, I think would be helpful, at least for the jobs I see that are out there. Yeah, I guess I get, Lindsay, feel free to jump in. But uh, yeah, I would say on, on my end, you know, in terms of kind of thematic things, um, I, I wish I had a better handle on some of the more social dimensions of, of fisheries. I mean, I, as Bo was saying, you know, I was trained in more uh, fish biology and fish ecology. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people <laughs> dynamics that that I wish I probably had a bit more of a handle on and I've had to learn um, just in the process. And then uh, maybe more broadly, um, you know, everything that I do in, in my position is is team science. So I think like on that side of things, just uh, having some training maybe in, in graduate school in terms of working in collaborative groups and how how to um, interact with folks that are maybe in, in different disciplines, how to talk across those disciplines, all of those, if, if that there was some initial training in that, I think as a as a grad student, you could hit the ground running on many of these just for um, interdisciplinary collaborations as well. Yeah, I agree completely with Abby and Bo. And I want to follow up on what Bo said about quantitative skills. I think that we have a lot of opportunities to learn modeling skills in grad school now. But what's more challenging to pick up sometimes and what's less available in the formal context is how to manage big data sets and how to collaborate with people while you're managing big data sets. So if I could, I would invest time in learning, um, learning how relational databases work and also how learning how version control and collaboration software works. It's very specific. Yeah. But those have been some of the things that have been super valuable to me. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, I would certainly second some of the things Abby emphasized in the um, team science side of things and organizational skills and kind of project planning, project management side of things as well that I think are a little bit under undersold in grad school, but come in very, very handy later on being, being able to like effectively manage projects. Um, all right, we're going to pivot again um, and jump into Alex Latska's question here um, that is, what do you see as the most critical needs for implementing climate adaptation based on your research? Specifically, what kinds of things do you think the CASCs and regional state partners should be doing to help take science to action? So um, let's break that out a little bit. Let's start with the first one um, and say, what do we see as the most critical needs for implementing climate adaptation um, based on research? It's actually funny that you asked this question, Colin, because I feel like you're doing an amazing job at it with helping Wisconsin prioritize uh, walleye lakes for climate adaptation. Um, I, I think that that's a huge part of it is um, sort of arranging for inland fisheries, arranging um, lakes into sort of resist except direct sites or setting thresholds for when you shift from a resist strategy to an accept direct strategy. The other thing that's come up several times in discussions is helping anglers adapt to new fish communities in those places that are going to warm, which again, I think Wisconsin's doing an amazing job of that at um, shifting or at increasing the effort put into warm water species like bluegill. I think that we could also do a lot of good in developing education programs that help um, that help like learn to fish programs include a wide variety of species. Because if we set people up with the suite of skills that they need to fish both pool and warm water fish when they're learning to fish, then they'll be prepared, better prepared to um, to respond to shifting fish communities when they encounter them. Yeah, I don't know that I have that much more to answer to that one. I mean, I think depending, it's very sort of context specific, you know, I, I can give you a different answer for the Great Lakes or each Great Lake. Um, but I think Lindsay helped put it in a broader context. I, um, I, I guess the only thing I would add is sort of, it's challenging to understand to what extent fish are plastic and sort of like if we are going to have um for we're going to try to keep with what we have or look for adaptive capacity to what extent you know more more information we have of the key species are they able to adapt do they have the genetic capacity to, to adapt that's one thing we haven't really talked about today if we had like a geneticist on the panel and all the great work that is completely uh, just blowing up in terms of genomics and how we're able to know so much more um, about not just, um, I, I'm not a geneticist, but I, I, I one is across the hall from me and she does an amazing job helping us understand, um, uh, see differences that we didn't see, for example, within and across populations. So um, that that's one of the when you ask about the adaptive capacity, that's something that I, I think about, I guess. Yeah, and I'll and I'll just add to that, thinking about kind of how Bo is, is um, mentioning kind of like other. I, I think for us, and I think we're we're doing a good job as a community moving beyond kind of like our typical climate change um, hypotheses in terms of relationships and expectations, um, but like moving beyond kind of those typical tropes and thinking about, um, you know, beyond just cold water fish being negatively impacted and, and just using kind of space for time um, comparisons in terms of like thinking about adaptive capacity or other um, elements of sensitivity and, and beyond just kind of that exposure side of, of climate adaptation and um, yeah, and I'll just mention that I think I, the casks 
focus on kind of that science to action piece that, that Alex mentions. And I think there are a few, um, we have an early career um, student fellowship opportunity, for example, um, that's actually looking to help students take their research and, and make it more applied. And so I think the, um, we understand the need um, and, and it's often a difficult um, in terms of implementation or, or operationalization, but at least we have that first step of acknowledging it. Awesome. And I guess while I'm off mute, looking to, to Colin's kind of follow-up yeah. question on <laughs> changing, um, you know, like how to change uh, attitudes and, and things like that. I think the, you know, having more information about opportunities or, or again, managing expectations of, of what we can expect to be a scenario in the future. So looking at plausible future scenarios and, and just almost a, a client, you know, acclimating people to what those uh, future conditions are likely to be. I think that will go a long way in kind of um, managing people's expectations of, of how the systems would change. But but it, that's, I, I say that and I recognize that that's not an easy thing to do, but, but at least starting to have those conversations, even if they're difficult and uncomfortable, will help. Yeah, is there anyone else here on the panel who wants to um, comment on Colin's question about the role of um, angler species preferences um, kind of influencing climate adaptation strategies? So how might willingness or not to substitute fishing for some species um, impact management actions? And then I think we'll pivot to our final question after that. I, I kind of touched already, but there's a lot of really good parallels from the trajectory of hunting participation. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, terrestrial animal populations that have kind of risen and fallen over the years, and you really see hunter participation kind of follow at a slight lag. So I'm, I'm thinking in particular of waterfowl and wild turkeys, which were both sort of at a low point in the 70s and 80s, and then um, hunters that are you know my age who were born in the 80s and 90s really learned uh, learned to pursue those species while we were learning to hunt because that's when their populations were on the uptake again. And I think that if we adopt a similar strategy with fish, we can we can make a lot of progress because the reason that so many people my age hunt wild turkeys and hunt waterfowl is because a lot of us had access to learn to hunt events that targeted turkeys and waterfowl. Or we had, um, you know, people to learn from who taught us to target turkeys and waterfowl, and then we had the opportunity to hunt those species. So I think if we can kind of, we don't even need to frame it as a climate climate adaptation thing necessarily to the public. Just say, hey, we have opportunity for these species. We're likely to have more opportunity for these species. Let's make sure that you have the skills you need to go out and enjoy, enjoy the outdoors. So it really just kind of speaks to resiliency in a very different way than we might think of it in terms of conservation or ecology. It's thinking about having a diversity of opportunities, fishing or hunting, and being flexible to sort of, I'm, I'm thinking of Lake Huron, where Chinook salmon used to be uh, dominant, and then after the alewife collapsed sort of unexpectedly, it shifted to a, I mean, there was a, there's a headache. I mean, there's a, there's a hiccup there, but eventually the the fishing preferences relaxed or shifted and walleye and lake trout and other salmon and species became um, just as enjoyed. Maybe they didn't have the opportunity or they had a little bit of a learning curve, but um, there was a shift there that sort of was reflective of that. And, and luckily there was a multitude of sort of predator species there um, and it wasn't just a sort of a mono fishery just for salmon. So, um. yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thought and interesting to think about within different contexts too, where some community, so social communities may be more willing to adapt and change, and some may not be able um, for cultural reasons and, and other socioeconomic reasons and such. Um, all right, so I think we have a couple minutes left, so I think we're going to finish off with a lightning round of our final question, um, where uh, our final question will be, um, everybody here I think will have one minute 
ish. So try to try to be brief. Um, of what future research avenue or topic are you most excited about exploring? All right, Abby, you're first. Then Abby, okay, I'll go oh. first. <laughs> <laughs> um, just well, I guess we're we're thinking on kind of. The, the rad framework again resist except direct for those that aren't familiar with it, I think a question that that i've had in a lot of conversations around rad are relating to. Um, kind of when to switch strategies and so for me that's a, a question i've been thinking about a lot in terms of you have a climate adaptation um, strategy that you're employing. But as the, the conditions and climate continue to change, you're likely to have to adjust that. And so helping inform that in a science, but helping use science to inform that is something that I'm interested in, in contributing to. Yeah, so I, briefly, I would say like, uh, I don't do as much research anymore, but this, um, this framework back here, um, we haven't like gone all the way around the circle. Like there have been some Oregonid sort of reintroduction efforts that started before this framework was implemented, but uh, now in Lake Erie in New York waters, there's going to be a reintroduction of Cisco, experimental reintroduction. So we have the chance to sort of start at the top and really put this into practice. And I think it's a really great partnership, science management partnership that I'm excited to sort of see how we do over the next couple of years. Uh, very similar to Abby, I'm really interested in how to develop decision points and reliable indicators, understanding that fish biology is super temperature dependent. Awesome. Well, with that, I want to give a huge thank you to Abby, Lindsay, and Bo for your partic participation today. Um, and this is a this is a great seminar, and I see Jess up there, so I'll hand it back over to Jess. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, for organizing this panel today. Thank you to our panelists for joining us. This was a great conversation. Um, as folks are starting to leave the room, I'm going to pop a poll up so you can tell us how we did today. And quick reminder that we will not have a science seminar in July. I know we typically have these once a month, but we are going to give that time to our team to prepare for our annual gathering and the next year of programming of these science seminars. So we'll be back here on August 24th, and I hope you'll all join us then. Thanks so much. <laughs>